Let's back up a bit, because there'd been a lot of activity at the New Zealand end of the colonisation process before the Scottish pioneers ever arrived. First of all, the New Zealand Company had sent the English surveyor Frederick Tuckett to search the entire South Island for a suitable spot for the new Scottish colony. If there is a good locale for a settlement in this island, I mean to have it. Tuckett looked first at the site that would later serve for an English settlement at Christchurch, but he dismissed it in favour of land in Otago. Better suited to small farms and agriculture, he thought. Tuckett walked enormous distances from Moiraki all the way south to the Clutha, but eventually determined on Otago Harbour as the site for the settlement. It had the three qualities he was looking for. First of all, a port to provide deep water for ships' anchorage, and then some flat land nearby for the township to develop on, and finally, agricultural land close at hand. Negotiations were then commenced with local Maori chiefs, and a sale agreement reached here at Koputai, later known as Port Chalmers. On the 31st of July, 1844, transferring an area estimated 400,000 acres from Tairoa Head to the Nuggets for 2,400 pounds. This piece of land was thereafter known as the Otago Block. The chiefs were getting their own economy going. They were the Rangatera. They signed the treaty in 1840 expecting uh, that uh, there would be visit new people coming and the, that they would rise with the growing prosperity, presumably, of what their future looked like. They had made sales. 1844, the Otako block was sold, and they did anticipate they would have tenths, you know, one-tenth of every parcel allotment of land. So they did think they would be a part of that new economy. A year later, the company reached an agreement with the Cargill-led Lay Association to establish the Otago settlement on a smaller piece of land within the Otago block of 144,600 acres. Subdividing and on-selling this land piece by piece was to be the basis for the New Zealand Company's Otago settlement. The company had then employed another English surveyor to begin that process. Charles Kettle came south from Wellington in 1846 to survey the Otago settlement, including the sites of Dunedin and Port Chalmers. With him came a small party of surveyors and labourers recruited in Wellington. These men and their families worked steadily until 1847, laying out the lines of Dunedin's principal streets and completing the surveys necessary for the later sale of land. But their brief did not extend to building roads or erecting the school, the church or houses, although some of the immigrants seem to have had the impression that all these facilities would be ready by the time the first party reached Dunedin. Some were so disappointed, in fact, at the primitive conditions when they arrived at the embryonic site of Dunedin, that a significant number abandoned the settlement almost immediately and sailed north on the John Whitcliffe to Wellington. It was there, just above the line of Princess Street, that Kettle erected his house, and from which his family would have watched the arrival of the first settlers as they squelched their way through the mud and shingle of a small beach that ran along here where the Toitu stream discharged into the harbour. In 1932, this plaque was erected here to mark the arrival spot. And it was unveiled by the elderly Mrs. Macassey, who as a two-year-old Elizabeth Kettle had no doubt been held up by her father to watch that very event. Just here on a prominent little knoll at the head of what later became known as Mance Street, that prefabricated house that had caused Captain Cargill so much trouble in Portsmouth was erected. It provided a home for Thomas Burns and his family. And if you think that sounds like a cosy sort of setup for the minister, his own account describes the first night after his family moved in, the 2nd of June 1848, when it began to snow and fine snow sifted through the boards down upon our faces as we lay in bed. 
Captain Cargo had meanwhile set up a bell tent on the beach, picked out from all the others by the scarlet facings it had. Now the surveyors had actually built him a house, but they'd chosen a very strange place to put it, way to the north, above the North Dunedin Flat where Pitt Street and London Street intersects. But Cargill quite rightly wanted to be where all the settlers actually congregated, down on Princess Street. And he too had a prefab house brought out from England, which was eventually erected above Princess Street between Stafford and Carroll Streets. The North Dunedin house sat empty until Dr Purdy, the doctor on a later ship, set up there. For the first six weeks or so, the women and girls stayed back on the boat at Port Chalmers, still occupying the berths that had been their home for all those long months at sea. Meanwhile, primitive barracks were under construction here along the foreshore in Dunedin. One set had already been built by the passengers of the John Wycliffe, and because all those passengers were English, it became known as the English Barracks. Meanwhile, a new one was being built for the Philip Lang passengers, and of course it became known as the Scotch Barracks. New Zealand company records reveal that much of this work was done by local Maori, using their traditional construction methods and materials, but with fireplaces and doorways finished by tradesmen among the passengers. We know that would have been part of their culture, to assist and support and show monarchy. There was, as I mentioned before, these people were expected, our people were asking, when are they arriving? They were anxious, they, they knew that uh, these resources, these people coming would create a new growth, a new opportunity for trade. So uh, they expected to be a part of that new, um, new economy. The barracks were fitted up with sleeping berths, just like on board ship, and an open fireplace. But the Scottish one, the larger of the two, was only 18 metres by 6 metres, so it must have been very cramped for all those people. And all the cooking had to be done outside, which, while the weather was fine, was no problem. But this being Dunedin, it soon turned wet and cold as winter approached, and it became not so pleasant. As Otago centennial historian A.H. McClintock wrote in 1948, The flimsy barracks were no place to house women and children during the soaking winter rains. It is recorded that on one occasion, when Burns visited the dismal place to conduct a service, his heart sank within him. For some of the women, with babies on their laps, were crouching on the low beds that were kept from the damp floor only by a lay of grass and fern. The wind was whistling through the thinly covered walls, and heavy drops of water, soaking through the poorly thatched roof, fell noisily into pools of ever widening on the miry floor. Little wonder that some of the women, heart stricken by the appalling hopelessness of their surroundings, were silently crying. This sketch by Charles Kettle shows the respective barracks on the shoreline. While this one shows them from the vantage point of Stafford Street, looking back down to the harbour. They were in the area now occupied by Ōtipoti House, formerly the Dowling Street car park, and at that time sitting just above the beach line which ran along the line of what became Lower High Street. This plaque, on the other hand, commemorates the first school, which doubled as the first church and was located just beneath here on a small shelf of land just above the beach and to the east of the barracks. It opened for business in September 1848 and was later extended with a stone portion. Otago historian James Barr fondly recalled this original very plain and functional first church. Erected on the slope at the foot of Bell Hill, it presented to the eye no single feature of comeliness or beauty. It bore the closest resemblance of anything to that of a rough stone barn. On the outside it was square, ugly, heavy, unhewn. Inside was the reflex of the out. Bare rafters, small square windows, gloom and darkness. For the first five years, this was probably the most important building in Dunedin, the place where every Sabbath communal worship was held, with Thomas Burns preaching with those carefully constructed sermons and James Adam leading the singing in that distinctive free church style in which only the human voice could be heard, unlike the Anglicans down the road with their organ, and only psalms out of the Bible could be sung, unlike the Wesleyans with their modern hymns. It was also the only place, apart from the hotel, 
where public meetings could be held until the mid-1850s. The Otago development represented the establishment not simply of a religious settlement which had um, evolved in, in Scotland, but all the essential elements of Scottish urban institutional structure were there very, very quickly. Schools, libraries, and above all else perhaps, the extraordinary development very early on in 1869 of the University of Otago. For a period at least, Dunedin was coloured by the Presbyterian ethos in a way that so much of Scotland was coloured by the same process. So undeniably a little Scotland, not, term, not simply in terms of those who came, but the institutional structure that they developed across the world. The primary task for most of the immigrants was to build their own homes, mostly using their own hands, a few basic tools, and whatever materials they could find in the bush. James Adam was one of the first to achieve this initial goal. He employed some local Maori to help him erect a basic house, again using their traditional methods so that it was more of a whare than a cottage, and run up in just four days. He didn't have enough money at that point to buy land outright, but he had secured a temporary lease of a quarter acre section in Princes Street from the New Zealand Company. It was just here where the Dunedin Grand Casino is today, but at that point was a little nook in the bush that covered this whole area. Princess Street at that stage was really just two surveyor's lines, marked out three kilometres long, 20 metres wide, but in reality, the street was just native flax, grass, tree stumps and boggy ground, crisscrossed by small creeks, including the Toitu, which crossed over here and discharged into the harbour just over there. Nonetheless, Adam wrote in his memoir of the great joy he had in bringing his young family off the Philip Lang at Port Chalmers and straight into their first little home in New Zealand. The entrance was through a leafy archway from Princess Street, and at the first sight of the rustic cottage, a cry of joy burst from my little girl in my arms and from the rest of my family. Here was a sweet reward for all my labour and toil for I was anxious that their first impression should be favourable. This really exemplifies the positive attitude of James Adam towards pioneering, in sharp contrast to those Wycliffe passengers who were so daunted by conditions that they escaped to Wellington rather than give it a go. It also explains why he was later selected to be the poster child of Otago immigration and sent back to Scotland as a recruiter to find more men and women like himself. In fact, in his memoir, he describes that. The romance of the emigrant life in its first stages was to me so enviable that if need be, I would not hesitate for a moment to pass through all the phases of pioneer life again, which in my case was full of hard work, pleasure, profit and healthful exercise. Of course not all of the pioneers had the necessary skill or capitals to launch straight into house building like the carpenter Adam. Most of them had to scrabble around finding work, usually labouring for the New Zealand Company or for the Reverend Thomas Burns while they saved their pennies towards future land purchases. One such was John Buchanan, a handloom weaver from Kirkintillich near Glasgow, who arrived on the Philip Lang with his wife Margaret and two young daughters. Kirkintillich is very typical of the 50 or so small industrial towns that grew up in Scotland at the end of the 18th century, into the, into the 19th century. Um, you have a people who, have, who are skilled, um, who, are, who are educated, and you know, they're, they're, looking out for, they're looking out for opportunities. These are people who know about the wider world. You know, they're, they're not just caught in a bubble at, at home. Um, they hear tales, it only takes you know, one family from one town to go, news comes back, and that kind of, traditional view of kind of chain migration, that sets, that sets in motion. So once one person's there, it's easier for others to follow. John Buchanan, for example, worked on erecting the Scottish barracks and was part of the crew that put together the original church and school later that year. Eventually he got a job as the beadle at First Church, a job that involved him being a general handyman and assistant to the minister. But in the meantime, he also had to work on building his family a cottage 
to get them out of the barracks. And we know from a letter he sent home to Scotland in August of 1849 that it took him a full 18 months to achieve that goal. And it would have involved him, you know, as well as working by day to earn his family's income, in the evenings trudging for long hours up this hill behind Dunedin to build his family a home. After great perseverance and difficulty, I have at length succeeded erecting a house single-handed, with the exception of two half days, which I got from Alexander Watson. The house consists of one apartment, about 12 feet square, the sides upwards of seven feet high are posted. The posts being about a yard asunder are wattled across and clayed betwixt the wattles. It is roofed with grass and I have a clay chimney attached to it. I've got a garden cleared of about 24 yards by 30 yards. It consists of potatoes and cabbages, which are looking well and also peas and a few garden seeds, but they are not looking so well. And this is probably where it was, here in what is now Jubilee Park in Dunedin's town belt. And the Buchanans weren't alone in this little posse on the hill up above central Dunedin. There were three other families who also built wattle and daub cottages here. They were the uh, Callenders from Paisley, the Macleans from Neilston and Renfrewshire, both Philip Lang passengers, and likewise, the Browns, also from Paisley, who came along a bit later on the Benicia in December 1848. Now, none of them could afford to buy or lease land, so they simply squatted here in what came to be called Squatter's Gully. They cleared an area of bush here on the side of the hill. They erected their primitive houses and they planted out gardens with cabbages and potatoes on the sun-facing slopes behind them. This painting likely shows the squatter's gully houses in the early 1860s, shortly before the area was taken over by Dunedin's new town board and the residents moved on. The Buchanans had been there by then for 14 years. A primitive little table from their house still survives in the museum collection. Constructed from the native timber Manuka and a piece of wood repossessed from the family's bunks on the Philip Lang, it tells us much about the can-do attitude required of the early settlers. But it wasn't all sweetness and light for the pioneers, and it must have been particularly hard for the women. Remember Thomas Burns expressing his pity for the young mothers, crying silent tears as they sat on their bunks in the immigration barracks, and the rain dripped through the roof. And it would be equally hard for someone like Margaret McCulloch, John Buchanan's wife, once she moved into the gloom of a mud hut in squatter's gully with a crying baby and thought back to the solid stone cottages and her strong extended family support network back in Kirk and Tillich. The family history indeed records that she became quite depressed in the early years here and that it was working on the harvest outside in the sunshine that eventually helped her to come to terms with her new life in New Zealand. Another glimpse into the pioneer woman's world is in this poem by Janet Kerr. Janet arrived in Dunedin in June 1848 on the Mariner with her husband and two small children. She was from Edinburgh and a member of the Free Church, so as far as the Otago Settlement Schemes organisers were concerned, she was an ideal candidate for Dunedin. But her poem gives vent to some major disappointments once she arrived on the ground here, and she's particularly scathing about John McGlashan and his fine promises about what Dunedin would be like compared to the mud, rats and misery that was the reality for Dunedin's young mothers in the clay houses that they had first to live in. The houses, they are made of clay. The rats, they have nae mair a day than hauk a hole and in they gay to the houses o' Dunedin. The fireside makes my heart may sear, the mud it is inch deep and mere, and bare shoon sticks to the flare in the houses o' Dunedin. If any country need be famed for cold and wet and bleak east winds, McGlashan then his pipes may tune for the praises o' Dunedin. Wives that at home gaed neat and clean are new ashamed for to be seen, mud to the knees and far abin are the housewives o' Dunedin. Since by deceit we've here been sent, we maun just try and be content, Life's wee wee while will soon be spent, and then we'll leave Dunedin. It should be noted that the poem's author Janet later moved to Invercargill. What Janet Kerr and John Buchanan are describing here is a wattle and daub structure, similar to a Maori forry and being constructed for whatever you'd find at hand in the bush. 
but slightly different in style and exactly what sort of materials they might have been. Now this was to be the most common form of housing among the original Otago pioneers with 46 wattle and daub houses, just edging out the 41 wooden cottages among the 99 homes that were built in Dunedin in the first year of settlement. Archibald MacDonald, the steerage passenger from Stirling, whose diary aboard the Philip Lang was so full of complaints, also had one. His was here on the corner of London and Stuart Streets. Many of the settlers who would follow in the years ahead would also begin their colonial lives in wattle and daub homes, especially those in the country districts. Sod houses and those made from sun-dried mud bricks were other alternatives. In Dunedin itself, proper wooden cottages quickly became more common as carpenters and sawyers arrived and made house building materials much more easily available. Another variation was to build a house from fern trees or punga logs. These tended to be very simple structures too and just a first stage habitation until sawn timber and skilled tradesmen became prevalent. But one such Dunedin house was built on a somewhat more substantial scale, and it happens to have survived right down to the present. And here it is, Fern Tree House in Wakari. This is the oldest surviving house in Dunedin, and dates from the second year of settlement. It was built by John Borton, a surveyor and civil engineer who arrived on the Cornwall in September of 1849. Now he was English and one of those men of means, whose presence and money proved so vital to the development of the settlement, who's come in here as outsiders, compromised the exclusiveness envisaged for Otago by Burns and Cargill. Also on board the Cornwall in 1849 was a Scottish carpenter from Dornoch, Robert Murray. After Borton brought his section of land here, he contracted his former shipmate to build him a house. Murray did so by cutting and squaring punga logs from the surrounding bush and plastering them together with clay. These were then faced and contained within a wooden framing. The roof was made from overlapping wooden shingles, the most common alternative to thatching in the pioneer cottages. Originally there were three rooms downstairs and another two upstairs, so it was a pretty substantial structure compared to most in the primitive village down around the harbour, and fairly unusual for a fern tree house, which were more often very simple affairs. Like the squatters' gully settlers, another group of four families from the Philip Lang got permission to set themselves up on a piece of land here in what is now Dunedin Southern Cemeteries. And so like John Buchanan, the Bars, the Gillies, the Marshalls, and the Patricks built themselves a row of cottages here, and because they were all formerly handloom weavers in Paisley, near Glasgow, this spot became known as Little Paisley. One by one, the families garnered enough money to buy their own sections of land and moved off the hill. All except for John Barr. He became Captain Cargill's right-hand man, and when his boss built a new home nearby at Hillside, Barr opted to remain right where he had started and develop his original furry into a decent wooden cottage. In 1852, Barr set up a loom here made for him by William Willocks, a cabinet maker from Brecon and Forfarshire who'd arrived in Otago on the Mariner in 1850. And with that loom, Barr wove the very first cloth to be made in Otago. Many pioneers would later be dressed in clothing made from the cloth woven by Barr here in Little Paisley. While the weaving operation never developed into the industrial scale enterprise that some had hoped for, it is nonetheless of real historical significance, remembered today by two of Barr's shuttles in the Toitu collection. This painting by Edward Abbott, one of Kettle's survey party, shows a view from Little Paisley in 1849, or at least a rather idealised version of what Dunedin looked like at that early point. In 1858, however, Little Paisley was selected to become the site for Dunedin's second cemetery, and Barr won the job of being its first sexton. The place name has gradually faded from use, but John and Elizabeth Barr, 
remained here in their little cottage until their deaths and were buried not far away at all. But their son, William, their oldest son, subsequently mayor of Mornington, did one better than them. He was actually buried here, the exact spot where the half stone of that little cottage had been. You might wonder how Kaitahu felt about all these developments in their backyard. It must have been rather overwhelming with all these newcomers arriving, notwithstanding the long years of experience of Pākehā in their midst, in the Otago Harbour and along the coast in the years preceding the arrival of the pioneer party of Otago settlers. So when they arrived, of course, they came into the, the lower harbour after a long voyage from their homelands. And so clearly the immigrants were keen for new fresh food and, and other provisions. And our people were, my understanding, quite eager to provide it. Show that manaki tanga, you know, they were coming um, and expected, they were expected, you know, and so there was no animosity that I'm aware of and uh, more opportunity, really. And uh, so our people even came up into Dunedin to help, as I understand it, help build their, their initial whare and uh, trade it and uh, provide fish, potatoes and other resources to assist the new, the new settlers. Māori from Otaka and further afield would beach their canoes here and then sell the pioneers their fish and potatoes. Early settler diaries are full of references to these early interactions with Māori, and all of them positive. And I think the key point that really comes through with that early correspondence is the interaction with Māori who were here, that Māori helped them uh, adjust. And it was a really uh, good relationship that comes through. Uh, curiosity on the part of the migrants towards Māori. Uh, I, I, the sense I get just a really good relationship and just if I can give one little example, uh, when one Scottish migrant arrived on the vessel, they played the pipes as the ship was near the shore and in return Māori uh, gave a haka. During their trading visits to Dunedin, Māori stayed in traditional whare rau or beehive huts in a little settlement up in McLagan Street, not far from the Buchanan's and just above this building on the hillside. That, that area was covered in flax bushes and had been a rich hunting ground for Kaitahu looking for kaka. But though their trade and food supplies was welcome, especially in the early years by the pioneers, their presence was not always quite so well received. Here in Dunedin, they hid um, behind the Tauraka Waka at the mouth of the Toitu stream. They did have a temporary sort of a settlement there and uh, they were shunned from there as well, and they started to be ostracised from the community. They weren't welcome as the com community grew stronger here in Dunedin. Many of the settlers were fearful of the native population. Their historical reputation as cannibals having become a staple of British knowledge about New Zealand. So when rousing Harker performed here at McLagan Street in the native encampment, these latent fears must have been aroused. John Maclay was a boy at the time, his family having come out from Scotland on the Multan in 1848 and ended up in one of the Wattlendorb cottages in Squatters Gully. In old age he wrote a memoir about growing up in Dunedin and he remembered all the boys and girls being frightened by this. When we got near the Maori camp, us boys and girls were terribly afraid of the wild Maoris dancing their war dances. All of the people about us were very much afraid of them. After a lot of complaints, the superintendent, Captain Cargill, and the magistrate, Mr. Sproud, and the Reverend Dr. Burns, got them to shift down to Otago Heads. And I always pleased they'd left this place forever. This wasn't really the case. For a considerable period, Maori continued to play a central role in trade in the middle of Dunedin here. But now, sleeping on the beach under their upturned boats when they were in town. When they began to be harassed there by drunken Scotsmen, this became a bit of a scandal. And in 1858, the Otago Provincial Government voted to erect a dedicated hostelry for the shelter of Māori here in central Dunedin. Uh, they complained about this to Wellington and obviously to the local provincial masters. So there was a bit of a tug of war between Wellington and, and the, the, the provincial government about how to treat our people. Um, Wellington presumably trying to meet their responsibilities. Wellington established a hostel for them to live in, something out of 
you know, shelter them. It was erected just here, where the Chief Post Office would later be now the Distinction Hotel. And we can see it in many photographs of central Dunedin in the 1850s. We know from at least one newspaper report that large Maori wedding parties would shelter here, all of them living in there together, just like on a marae. But that caused a bit of a scandal as far as the town's Presbyterian ministers were concerned, who felt it was indecent for both sexes to be accommodated together like that. We also know from public notices in Māori and early Dunedin newspapers and from dispensing records from an early Dunedin chemist that Kaitahu patronised local businesses and took advantage of the new products and services that Dunedin's establishment had now made available to them. Pioneer memoirs reference many interactions with local Māori, almost always positive experiences for both parties, but there were also some cross-cultural misunderstandings. How those relationships atrophied and Kaitahu became somewhat marginalised by settler society is beyond the scope of this film, but it is perhaps symbolised by the fate of the Maori house. Because by 1865, only a few short years after it had been erected, it was in the way of the widening of Princess Street. Uh, the, the local provincial leaders didn't like that, they wanted that building or that land for them, for the growing city, and uh, the provincial masters uh, had no interest in. It seemed, and were more about um, growing their city and um, having it run the way um, they desired it to be. Which, presumably, from what from accounts, and the difficulty our people had around these places, and having keeping their foothold there, not including them. It would be a century and a half before that early promise of a bicultural relationship in central Dunedin would once again begin to develop. Yeah, well, there were partial settlements because of the issues. Um, they got the rents back from the hostelry, from the, uh, the Crown. And so there were payments made to try and compensate for the loss. Uh, probably not a lot um, in the context of things but they still lost that beachhead and that opportunity to trade. Memorials such as this are part of a resurgent Kaitahu cultural and economic presence in the city, a process that honours those who were here before as well as those who came to found the city. The overall settlement of the Naitahu claim in 1998 um, has helped um, address some of those issues. We took that as a a full and final on the land claims and uh, have agreed to move on from there. Uh, so uh, that's part of the Ngaitahu settlement. The formation of the Waitangi Tribunal and the uh, provision to take cases right back to 1840, which occurred around 1985, which really opened the door to allow some of this more fulsome settlement, investigation and settlement of these these issues. Some we did, didn't win, some we, did, some we have. Overall, the package is something that is allowing Nei Tahu Whanui, all of us, to, to uh, move forward and try and build ourselves strongly into this Te Waipanamu economy. Mm -hmm.